thanks for joining me. I'm Scott, and this is a Guild D55, 1978, serial number 120452. And it's in because it's probably going to need a neck reset, but it definitely needed a truss rod rescue and a neck straightening and a neck untwisting. It might also need a new bridge because it's been shaved down over the years and it has a pretty low saddle to try to make it playable, which, you know, still didn't work because the truss rod wasn't working because the truss rod nut was mangled beyond recognition and pressed down into the, the wood so hard that it was cupped. And so the, the, that was the washer. So the nut couldn't do its job. And luckily this is, the guild is the same 1032 threaded rod that is in the Gibsons. And uh, Stu Mac sells a truss rod rescue kit. Um, you've probably seen Dan Earlywine's video with Tomo where he fixed his Mustang neck. And that's, that's pr pretty much what I'm talking about doing there. I've already done that, but now I want to show you something new. Now for the unveiling of the neck untwisting jig. Here it is. You've seen this already, Proper's Guitar Workstation. But you haven't seen this because it's brand new. This is the neck untwisting jig. Where the guitar is set in place. Well, why am I describing it? Well, I'll just grab the guitar and do it for you. So what I'll do is I'll set the neck in the workstation, I mean the guitar, down here, right like that. I'll secure it as needed. I will probably put the, uh, the neck support somewhere in the middle. And then we're going to heat the neck for at least a half hour. Then I'll start pulling it down. So I've never really seen anything quite like it before, but you'll see that it's it's kind of canted this way from uneven string tension and the uh, truss rod washer being mangled over the years. I'm going to heat it up and then pull it with this tuner um, from the base side, and then I'll push up from the platform with a jack on the treble side. And at the same time, I'll try to get the neck into a back bow and then I'll see if refretting the neck and fixing the truss rod washer with the truss rod rescue will solve the problem. All right, that's 30 minutes. I'm going to put a little call here and here. Radius calls. I'm going to Clamp the neck, the sixth fret, get a little back bow happening. Down here I've got my scissor jack on this side. Push up a little on the Stock. And then I'm going to tighten this to start twisting. There we go. And then we'll let it cool. So I've run it through the rigors of the neck untwisting jig two days in a row. And on the third day, I came in, I took off the clamps and everything. Well, actually, uh, I, I, took the, I took the truss rod wrench and I tightened up the truss rod is, until it felt really, really snug. And I pulled off the clamps and everything. I took the guitar out of the... The jig and 
It was in a back bow. The neck was in a back bow. Even over here, it seems to measure, you know, the same amount of back bow on the bass side and the treble side. So now I'm continuing with pulling the frets. We're going to refret this guitar, string it back up and see if it stays flat. Having it flat without strings on is one thing, but keeping it flat with strings on is a whole nother thing. And I told him when he was here, I said, I'm going to charge you for $1,300 worth of work, install a new bridge, refret the guitar, or uh, pull the neck and reset the neck, and all this other stuff. If you've got a horrible twist in your neck, what's the sense in me doing all this work to make your guitar perfect, or 99% close to perfect, and only be at, still at 70% when we're all said and done because you still got a twisted neck. It's unethical to charge someone a bunch of money for repair when the neck is completely twisted when you're done. So, so first things first. So when I'm sanding the fretboard, I want to stay away from this middle part. Over 40 or 50 years this middle part becomes, you know, it needs a little help. It needs me to, the, the forces of string tension tend to bend the neck up at the nut more than in the middle. And, uh, and then also, because it needs a neck reset, and I'll probably end up doing one, this always tends to have a hump. So I'm gonna focus at the body joint, and right here at the nut. And I'm gonna take a couple longer passes with a longer block. After a while of concentrating here and here with the short block, I'll go over the whole thing with a longer block. Just to homogenize the whole thing. But I'm not done yet. I'm going to concentrate on those two areas first for a while off camera. And then I'll do what I just did there. Clean up all the slots and we'll be in business. Okay, now after the 80 grit, I'll go with in, in here with some 150 grit. After 150 grit, 220, 320, 400, and 600. And then we'll be ready to go. Back even just a few years ago, I might try to just sand the humps out of this neck. But what a bad idea that would be, because every time I sand over this abalone and mother of pearl, I can see that I'm shaving it down a little bit, thinning it out. And uh, that's about the last thing you'd want to do on a beautiful piece of artwork like this, is uh, compromise these inlays. They're just so beautiful. And now I'm up to 400 grit. I gotta try to preserve those babies as much as possible. So that's one of the reasons I like to heat set the neck and do my heat treatments is so that I don't end up removing precious wood or inlays. We've also got some really neat bindings going on. I mean, they inlaid binding into this or whatever. It's very interesting. I think that angle, you can see the, the beautiful work a little, a little better right there. This is 600 grit. This is almost just polishing it up. I 
hit it with the triangle file one more time. Samantha. Too clean. I clean the slots of the grease and the grime. See that? Grease and grime. Look at all that. It's crazy. First thing I like to do is get a piece of my fret wire and give it a little bend. And this is a 14 inch fretboard radius. So I want to bend it to, I guess, about a 12 inch radius. I just want to bend about one fret worth. The fifth fret's where I'm where I'm gonna put this baby. Okay, so here it's over radiused. You can see a little light underneath the middle section of it. And I'm gonna come in here and cut it to length. little overcut. See how I'm angling it? Got a little angle going. Let me angle the other side. So it's angled on both sides, coming out this way and this way. And it's still oversized. Now I'll cut it. I meant to say, now I'll nip it. Actually, I need to uh, change this part out. Hold on. So they're labeled one through four, these little, these little pieces. It's so rare for me that I'm working on wide fret wire. I usually, I mean 90% of the time I'm working with narrow fret wire on acoustic guitars. That's just, What's going on over here? I don't know what the heck. I'm gonna go with number three, because this is not the widest, but getting close to it. It's the second widest, pretty much, uh, available wire that I carry, that I stock. Let's get this baby on here. And we'll be nipping. We'll be nipping in a minute. I don't know if you can see it, but this is nipper size three. The little arrow pointing towards the three. And the three is actually over here on this side. Okay, and then I take my piece and nip it. Both sides. Little nippage. Now, next what I do, I take this three-quarter MDF that has a slot cut in it. This is the Ian Devlin method. And I flip it over. And I set it down. So it's held firmly there on the corner. And... I just removed the rest of that uh, piece of the tang that that is left after the, I use the nipper. There's a little remnant of the tang on the bottom side of the crown, and that's what I'm smoothing over right there. 
and I'm doing that with the nut and saddle file. The fine toothed file. Not the extra fine. Now the next thing I do is I warm up my glue. I take a little bit of water in the baby bottle warmer and I put my glue in the syringe and in the water. That's a 19 gauge syringe there. And this is fish glue. Um, it's the liquid fish glue from Stumac. It comes in a red bottle. Last time I bought it. This will start steaming and creating some heat. There you can see it's steaming. I'm getting warm. Next I clean the frets with the naphtha. Sometimes there's a little bit of uh, oil on the tang. That looks pretty clean. Now this first fret is just a test fret. I don't know if the tang needs trimmed. But I have a, another tool called a fret barber, which I will use. If this fret seems like it's a struggle to get it down seated in here, I'm going to get the fret barber going. We'll trim the tings so they're a little less wide, a little more narrow in width. Sometimes I need to do that, sometimes I don't. It depends on the slots. I don't like to modify the slots, I like to modify the tang. And that's kind of the same thing that I have going on where I don't like to hog off too much wood off the fretboard. I'd rather bend it with heat. So let's see. Let's see what happens here. So I use the the Ian method. For cleaning off the old um, remnant of fret tang. Now I use the Doug Proper method of hammering in the fret. Well, this fret gave me little to no resistance going in, and it seems to have seated all the way. So I got a little wet paper towel. I had some squeeze out, which kind of lets me know that this tang filled the slot pretty well. There's not a, a ton of gappage under the fret tang down in the slot. So I continue on doing like every other fret I'll do the next I'll do the third and the seventh fret and after each pair of frets by the time I make it to the the ninth and the first fret with spaces in between I'll check the uh, the back bow and see if it started to to back bow or if it stayed straight or what it did sometimes the board will compress a little bit and you'll get a little back bow as you go and if I do start to get too much back bow as I go then I'll get the fret barber out and I'll trim off just a, a tenth of a, oh, like a one thousandth of an inch, or two thousandths of an inch off the, the barbs on the edge of the tang with the fret barber. If needed, we'll see where we, we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, this is the third fret. This was the second fret I, that I um, installed. And it looks like a three thousandths feeler gauge will not get in. And I'm not going to make the judgment call on whether to uh, use the fret barber just yet because, you know, sometimes you can't judge after the first fret seeing how it goes in because all these slots, you know, that might be the loosest slot of the 22. Who knows? Or 20. Anyways, the third felt pretty much like this, the same thing as the fifth. Let's see how the seventh goes. Okay, there's four frets. 
I checked for excessive back bow and there is none. The neck is pretty much where it was when I started. So I'll continue on. I'm going to do 1 through 13. I'll probably force it into a slight bit more of a back bow with, a, with my long um, straight edge and one clamp in the middle and let it rest overnight. And we'll string it up tomorrow. We'll see how we're looking. See if that see if that twist comes back. So there it is. Usually I put the block at the first fret and I clamp I put the clamp at the sixth fret. But since I've got this area mostly under control and there's still what seems to be a little bit of needed straightening in this area, I moved this forward one fret and I moved that in between the 7th and 8th fret. So, Look at that baby. That is brand new bone nut and a lot of problems were solved. One, this E string sounded like mud and now it sounds glorious. Our action is fixed. The neck is so straight, it's crazy. The brake angle is good. This is a new, taller bone saddle, and it is. It's just wonderful. This action could be this low and raising the saddle. That's how drastic a neck straightening service can, can be. It's astonishing. My string height at the 12th fret, and this is without a capo at the 1st fret, is 6 ths on the bass strings, or the, e, the low E string, and about 4 and a half 60 ths on the high E string at the 12th fret. And I have plenty of saddle that I can shave down if I need to. These are 12 through 53 strings. Um, Jack wanted me to put on his 13 through 56 heavy, you know, medium <laughs> heavy strings. I, I don't know. I, I can't even play a guitar with strings that thick on it. But he's a bass player. So there should be a little more adjustment to do after we put those on. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the strings off again and dress the frets. They've been slightly dressed, but they're not polished really, really good and crowned. There's a few that need crowned. This guitar actually has a pickup, a little little piezo pickup. It's just a single sensor. And I plugged it into this bass amp just to get a little extra oomph. I tune this one's tuned flat right now to E flat. And but what I do suggest like to the owner um, is just you know when you're not using it, just uh, just tune down a little, you know, put it back in the case, set it wherever on the couch. Maybe tune the tune both uh, the E strings down to a D. Take a little tension off the neck, just to give it a break, because, you know, it's been, uh... It's had a hard time living its life with a, with a truss rod nut that was so concave or convex. Anyways, guys, appreciate you tuning in and sticking around to the end. Catch you on the next one. Take care.